Welcome to another episode of the Chronic Comeback Podcast. Today, I'm really happy and excited to have on the show, Lindsay Vine. Lindsay, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Nice to be here. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've, I've obviously looked up your story and, you know, what it is doing today to help other people. Um, but yeah, what I'd really like to understand is, well, obviously go through your story, but if we could go back before, you know, you got symptoms, like you started to get sick, what was life like before then? Did you always have something kind of not quite right with your health? Maybe if you could just talk us through a little bit about that and then bring us into the beginning part of the story where, you know, things maybe took a bit of a turn. Yeah, no problem. It's one of those funny things in retrospect, your your life looks really different than <laughs> when yeah. you were living it. Um, because in my 20s, I got sick with ME-CFS at 28. But in my 20s, I mean, my 20s were amazing. But I also had a lot of infections. Now that I really think about it, a lot of urinary tract infections, I got strep throat many times, really monthly when I get my period, I get sick. And I didn't really eat very well. Now, retrospectively looking like I was a vegetarian, but not a good vegetarian. One of those vegetarians who like, like, I thinks nachos is a staple, you know. <laughs> so I definitely wouldn't say I was like concerned about my health at all, even though my body was probably giving me a lot of signs that I should be more concerned <laughs> about my health. Yeah. And then I did my master's degree, which was in public health, and it was extremely stressful for me. And I don't think it necessarily had to be as stressful as it was. I kind of made it into something very stressful. I had a lot of imposter syndrome going on, I think. Um, a lot of people who take public health masters are like pre-med, so they want to be doctors. So I was comparing myself to those people. Whereas I'm more on the artsy side, right? So I, I was nothing like them. I had different skills. But a lot in the program too was like, you should be networking. You should be doing this. And I just always felt like I was trying to catch up. And in retrospect, I was having panic attacks. Like I'd wake up at night, like in a, a panic attack, but I didn't even I'd just keep going, just keep going. <laughs> so it came to the point where... I was doing my thesis and a lot of bad things were going on. I had gotten lice because my roommate was a teacher and she brought home lice and we kept passing it back and forth because we both have thick hair. And I think you can kind of imagine how that would contribute to CFS because I always had this itchy feeling, even if they were gone, it was like, oh my God, is that them? Is that them? And people with CFS know that fear response, right? Like when you get a symptom of like, oh no, is that something? So I think that might have triggered that overstimulation of my limbic system. Yeah, along with, I got strep throat multiple times at that point. Antibiotics didn't work, so I had to take more antibiotics and more. Um, during my breaks, I was watching the show Breaking Bad, <laughs> which is so stressful. You're like, stress, stress, stress. I'm gonna take a break and then stress yourself out more. So there's a lot of things in retrospect that led to literally me handing in my master's thesis, having this like wave of relief of like, it's done. And then the next day waking up with no energy, like my body was done. It was, and like scary, no energy. I mean, people with CFS understand the difference. Like fatigue is, is really intense. So there was a lot going on that led up to it, I would say, but my life before, like I, I've traveled to 35 countries, you know, did archaeological digs. I lived in multiple countries. Yeah, I had a really great 20s. It just, I wasn't concentrating on my health, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting that you say, <clears throat> I've said this on a couple of podcasts, like 28 was where it kind of, the the straw broke the camel's back for me as well and 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 yeah. I've I've heard that like around 27 28 and I think it's just because well some people are maybe a little bit better earlier on in their 20s at realizing these things but yeah I had to be like bashed over the head with it before I could yeah realize and and slow down um so you woke up that day and was it like a complete um like night and day from the day before or had it been like a gradual thing that you were suddenly just 
wiped out and like what did you do did you go straight to like a medical doctor I think what it was because um I thought it was strep throat again because it just like had this like swollen feeling in my neck and it was just like yeah that exhaustion I don't remember if I went right away to a doctor but I definitely started going to doctors when it wasn't getting better and I'd go to the clinic and be like why am I sick? And I remember doctors saying, oh, I think you're just getting virus after virus. It'll be fine. You'll be fine. And just like getting so upset and having all these theories, like maybe I have HIV, of course, I don't, you know, all these things go through your head of like what it could be. Mm-hmm. And um, just completely freaking myself out into oblivion, really for months, months and months. And it was interesting because that first year, I actually did get better for a while. Um, I went to one doctor. I'd never even heard of ME-CFS, but she said to me, "Um, I think it's a post-viral thing, but I don't think it's ME-CFS. You'll be fine. And something about her reassuring me that it wasn't that or it wasn't going to be something permanent helped me to actually start to get better. It also coincided when I like stopped working, I'd finished a contract and I was like, I just need to take a break. And it was summer, which I always do better in. Um, And I started to get better, better, better for a little bit in the first year. But then in September, I started a new job again. And within two weeks, I fully crashed. And that's when I was like, like, I have something like this is really scary because it it was back and it was really really bad so the first year was like a big roller coaster (laughs) god yeah do do, do you think like looking back on what you know now like had you not got so like really stressed in those and like ruminating over the worst case scenario and like I guess focused on something that could maybe calm yourself down and and put everything into perspective and maybe had a bit more of a positive message Uh, sent to you do you think that could have really helped take things in a different direction because I often think this I think about that too but honestly I think I hadn't got to a lot of my like core issues that Mm. probably caused it to come back and like like even that summer that I was taking off and was healing it's so funny how quick we go back into that like I should be working. I should be looking for a job. I should, you know, my brain went straight to that. I could have taken more time off. I could have let myself fully like recover before I started to go back towards a new job. And I took a job that was not my passion. I was like, before that, I was like, I'm going to find a job I love. And guess what? I again went to a job that wasn't perfect for me, but they wanted me and it paid well. So Um, A lot of my core issues, I think, were not dealt with in terms of, um, you know, valuing myself and valuing my health and all the things that we can talk about that um, can lead people to stay sick. Yeah. And those are the two criteria for getting a job in your 20s. Pay well, they wanted me. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. Okay, so that first year went by, you got a little bit better, took a new job got loads worse what happened after that so that's when I got a diagnosis of ME-CFS which for some people can be really good but I think can also be a little problematic because then you're a person who has this illness you know and I was you know trying so many specialists just like most people going through the rigor morale of, (laughs) of different specialists with them saying there's nothing we can do for you and me just being in a constant state of anxiety. I was still working. I worked that whole year of that contract, even though I was, oh, it was so hard. I I was going home and just like sleeping or being in bed always when I wasn't at work or crying because I was so exhausted. And even at work, I was, I was like reviewing grants and my brain, was so foggy that <laughs> I don't think I did a very great job at that job <laughs> but uh, yeah it was just it was rough it was rough I was I was looking in a lot of a lot of the wrong places I did end up finding a fatigue specialist um tried some drugs in the end making things worse <laughs> you know until yeah. the end of that year of that contract and then I was just done I couldn't work anymore 
I was like, I need to really heal. Yeah. No, so. I, I, and, but when you say really heal, did you know what that was at that point? And like, what was going to be your focus for that like, period of time? Well, that's really interesting. So that winter I went to Thailand because I was like, I just have a feeling I can heal if I go somewhere warm and sunny I know you've had similar thoughts yeah. go somewhere where my body feels good um so that winter I went to Thailand I did um a Buddhist meditation center retreat oh, wow. um that was around the time I learned about brain retraining um I didn't take a program but I bought Phil Parker's book yeah so I was trying to teach myself and I did get a little bit better I think I got up I always measure in steps so I think I got up to about 5,000 steps that winter, but um, it didn't end up being long lasting because when I came back, I think I did it. I did a drug change for sure. One of the things one doctor put me on was uh, antidepressants, you know, being like, oh, it's just a kind of depression. And those antidepressants, when you try to switch up doses, you have to be very careful. That's a warning to anyone out there because our bodies are extra sensitive. Um, go even slower if you're reducing amounts than the doctors say, because that also, I've, I've had many huge crashes from trying to change doses of different drugs. Yeah. So yeah, and the other thing I did around that time is I moved. I moved here in Vancouver to this small island off the coast of Vancouver. I have a family friend who has a cabin there and I was like, I'm going to heal in nature. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> my plan was like to live there and just heal and look at the whales. And the interesting thing there, I ended up being there for three years. Wow. And when I look back, I like gradually got worse and worse and worse when I was there, even though I had the beautiful nature, it was so isolating. Like, <laughs> And looking back, I can see now that I was really um running from people taking care of me like I didn't like being a bother I didn't like being a burden and I was ashamed to be a person who was in bed all day you know and my friends are out hiking and their lives are progressing so my reasoning for going to the island I think was a bit deeper than I thought mm. and in the end it it was not the right decision for me yeah. I ended up getting worse and worse yeah, no, I know what you mean though. Like, uh, I think I had that 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 kind of feeling of like, yeah, wanting to go somewhere else and be away from it all. And I think what I found is that actually, if you can find something that makes you more connected to not necessarily who you were, but like other people that are like living in quote like normal lives, um, then that's better because it you could go to like a far away. You know, they talk about it with meditation, don't they? You could go to a, a cave and meditate for 12 hours a day, but then how do you integrate that back into your real life? And yeah, I think loneliness is not a good, <laughs> not a good feeling to feel on a, on a regular basis. Um, no, it's but, not good for our health. No. I'm really passionate about the topic, actually, because I think it affects our health more than we realized. And like humans... Um, if you read like the book Sapiens or anything, you see that like for hundreds of thousands of years, we're communal creatures, like we're, we're kind of designed to be in communities. And uh, you really have to watch that with CFS because the mind F, I won't say the F word, but <laughs> of this illness is that we isolate ourselves because we're so sensitive to noise and light often, and we just stay in bed. And that is actually often the worst thing for us because we need connection. So, so it's really hard. So in the so it's three years have gone by. What, mm -hmm. what was it that made you kind of realize oh, I need to change up that environment and and move and move away? Well, so yeah, there's a lot even in that time because I went to Thailand again the next winter, which is when I did uh, DNRS actually. Okay. And um, the second winter in Thailand, I got a lot better. I got up to, I think, eight or 9,000 steps. And I thought I was like, good, you know, <laughs> because they teach you if you do a brain retraining course, you know, they teach you not sorry, not every brain retraining course. They're all very different. But in DNR specifically, you're supposed to be telling yourself in six months, I'm going to be 
here. You know, you're picturing yourself fully better. And I came back that second time from Thailand and um, I was doing so well. And then I had a major crash again when I got back to that island again. It might have been partially the psychosomatic issue of being alone again on this island <laughs> might have been a mold issue and then the place I was staying definitely had some mold there was definitely some drug changes I was probably trying as well but I crashed again and that's when I got so depressed because yeah I think when you're just so sure that you're you've got it <laughs> and brain retraining really convinces you you've got it and then when I crashed again, ooh, that was a deep blow. And I know I've had a lot of people contact me who've had the same situation because a lot of the brain new trainings don't program. Some do, but some don't really prepare you the, for what happens if you do have a huge crash again. So that was really rough. And the next few years after that, while I was still on the island, I think were just really hard for me to make any progress. And what changed, there's a few things that happened. I really, really like, I continued to get lower and lower. I hit my rock bottom where I was like, is it even worth living anymore? You know, one of those, I had one of those, a few of those days actually, where it was, I had sinus infections. I had candida. I was living alone. I was pretty much bed bound. I had piles of tuna cans beside my bed so that I didn't have to get up to go to the kitchen to eat. I would just like eat from my tuna cans. And I had this like large Tupperware I'd pee in so I could just go to the bathroom once a day to empty it. Like so sad all by myself on this island. And I just also there, there are people that would have helped me, but I didn't want to ask for help. I didn't. It was also COVID. So the timing was really terrible. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would call my rock bottom when I was like, I was ready. I was done. <laughs> it was kind of that choice of like, am I done or do I do something to make a major change? Um, one of the things I did to make a major change, I asked my stepdad to pay <laughs> for CFS health. Um, do you know the CFS health program with Toby Morrison? No. Okay, it's, it's a program out of Australia. It's quite expensive, but um, I can talk about some of the pros and cons of different programs, but this one's more lifestyle focused. It helps people with pacing, um, diet, sleep, those kinds of factors. There's a doctor as part of the program. There's also a mindset coach and a movement coach. So um, I can talk about our, our programs guide later, but it's in the lifestyle program. The other great thing about it that was helpful to me is that um, it's for six months. So I got to make some friends in that program, um, some really good friends, including my podcast partner, Stu, who was also in that program at the same time. Yeah, quite a few people that I'm still in touch with. And that, I think, was very vital for me to have that community of other people working on recovery as well, like mm -hmm. recovery minded friends. It also gave some accountability because you check in every every week and you say your wins. So it was a piece for me. I wouldn't say it was the whole story because around that time, my friends had an intervention, which I can't tell you how grateful I am <laughs> to have the friends I have in my life. Yeah. They came to the island. They were like, Lindsay, this is this is clearly not working for you we're going to figure out a way to get you back to Vancouver. And I was like, there's no way I can't afford to live in Vancouver. I can't handle moving. They found me a place. They moved me. They brought me meals every day for the first month or so. Nice. They, they truly saved my life. Like they got me out of that situation. And that was a little over two years ago. And it's been all uphill since then. Wow. <clears throat> that is a, they are some really good friends. Uh, yeah, yeah, amazing. I'm very lucky. So you mentioned this program in Australia, uh, yeah. obviously getting out of that environment. I really do think that, <clears throat> speaking on the uh, episode recently, like a pattern, like pattern interrupt 
and like in terms of changing your location, changing what you're used to, changing that habit is like one of the biggest things I've realized about going to Bali. Um, and although you had a, I guess, a negative pattern interrupt when you went to the island, you kind yeah. of had, I guess, would that do you see that now as kind of like another interrupt that was a, a an accelerator for your recovery? Yeah, yeah, a positive one. Yeah, yeah, I really I agree with you. I think a lot of I spend a lot of time thinking about yeah, what's the cause of the change and what caused it. I've thought about your story a lot too, and how you've incorporated working out as a part of your recovery. I find that really interesting because for me, a big step in my recovery has been um getting a dog and <laughs> i can show you oh, she's right here <laughs> oh. Which, like was i really ready to get a dog i mean that was a scary decision i've that had huge cheaper. crashes before um oh. and i definitely it could have gone real badly yeah. but it's i think it's it's the change it's that um, i wasn't lonely anymore i have this thing i literally wake up every morning in the state of gratitude um, I had to push myself because she needs a lot longer walks than I was capable of doing, but I knew I could do it. I started doing DNRS again every day because I knew it worked. I just was so let down by it after I had crashed that I couldn't do it for like two years. So I agree with you. I think there's the the change and it's like an external motivator that's different from what you're used to yeah there's something to that that I think is really pivotal yeah no for sure I mean yeah having like a something around that loves you unconditionally and it's just yeah it's as cute as that um <laughs> is always going to help um so I think what's been really good uh, I guess the feedback I've had about like me sharing what's been happening for me is that I think people like the fact that it's been gradual obviously I'd, I'd prefer it to have been overnight and I'm sure they would but I think that they find it maybe a little bit less daunting and that's what I felt when I although it was really inspiring for me to hear overnight stories I kind of just thought I can't imagine waking up tomorrow and feeling completely fine um and so a gradual story actually my brain could buy into it a little bit more in my belief system as well um, and it sounds like that's been the same for you right it's not been like well it sounds like it's very gradual there's been and there's been a lot of ups and downs it's like has it been in that two-year period has it been still downs as well as ups like how, how have things gone yeah definitely I agree about the gradual um, I interviewed Alex Howard recently for my podcast post viral and he talked a lot about how he never trusts a quick recovery. And it's really, if it's quick, it's likely you're going to have an issue in the future because, yeah, it, you got to learn. The part of healing is learning um, in terms of pacing and how to take care of yourself and work up slowly in a way that people like us naturally aren't great at usually. Yeah. <laughs> I think that is a part of the thing itself. But yeah, I have had ups and downs for sure. No like huge crashes where I've gone back to bed bound though. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say I'm still on the antidepressant at a low dro dose and I'm still on LDN, low dose naltrexone. Because part of me is still like, I don't want to F with that because <laughs> changing doses never goes well with me but I'm okay with being on it right now. Like my health is getting so good at this point that, uh, you know, I could probably start weaning down if I wanted to, but I'm allowed to like make the choice of when I want to do that instead of having this, like, I got to do it naturally um, obsession, which I think a lot of us get into also like the other end of the spectrum from wanting the doctors to save us. We go to like, yeah. I got to totally do it naturally. I think that both have their issues. Yeah. So yeah, I've had downs. Um, there's a whole other aspect to the story too. While I was on that island, I also was in a very serious car accident and I was thrown from the car and got a really bad concussion. So some of my issues that are hard to distinguish between CFS and concussion symptoms, like uh, I have issues with screens still, like a lot of movement, but 
In terms of energy, which was my main CFS symptom, I definitely have had issues with my immune system and getting infections and my heart and all that stuff. But um, in terms of energy, I think it's been pretty upward trajectory with, of course, times where I push it. Like when I went on my first hike last summer, there was definitely a few days after where I was like back to that state of feeling very tired and brain foggy, but accepting like this will pass mm. really a big release of fear is such a huge part of it. And I think for, for me and for a lot of people, like I'm not afraid anymore of those setbacks, you know, that, that's it. Yeah. I, I, I totally, that totally resonates with me. Um, like I still think I have a bit of fear to be honest, but still, I actually see those setbacks as a good thing because once you get through them, you build more and more confidence and you build just more and more resilience. Um, Like as I sit here now, I've, you know, I've got certain symptoms I'm dealing with and, and they were a lot worse in the last few weeks, but because of I've seen these periods of, of going through them, I had full confidence that it would pass. Whereas before I was just like, Oh, I'm going to be stuck in this, you know, for, yeah however many time if not forever um so yeah do you do you feel like that in a way you're kind of because you know when you said push it and I think that phrase is like almost you know frowned upon in like the chronic illness like community but actually I think if you push something and you know push a, a little bit let's say and push a little bit beyond and you see wow I'm not as weak and you know broken as I thought I was that re is a reinforcement in itself and then you can keep moving forward um yeah, yeah what are your thoughts on that yeah you definitely have to um if you stay within the same envelope always without trying to expand it at all I think that's what your body gets used to and then you're kind of limited to that area I know I always think about this analogy I think it was Phil Parker in his book of like the these um, hopping fleas <laughs> in a bottle where even when they were released from the bottle, they only hopped as high as the bottle because that's what they were used to. Whereas they could have hopped higher. They just didn't try. Um, I recently interviewed Dr. Eleanor Stein, who's a psychiatrist and professor in neuroplasticity. And she talked about that, how the brain acclimatizes to what it's used to. So we have to keep very slowly, of course, I'm not saying go mountain climbing if you're bed bound right now, of course not. But um, pushing your boundaries little by little, um, you know, after a few weeks of being pretty consistent again, try again to push and push, or else you'll just stay at the same level. Yeah. And I think that's the problem with a lot of people who don't believe recovery is possible, is that then they don't push out of their what they can do. And then of course they're not going to recover, right? So yeah. it is really important to keep trying to to progress, in my view. No, I totally agree. Um I've got a few questions off the back of what you just said, but what would you what would you say if you had to add and uh, you know, I don't have a I don't no, I probably do actually. So I'm talking to myself. Um, <laughs> what, what would you say is like the biggest thing that made the biggest difference? Or if it's not just one thing, which it doesn't sound like it is, what would you say if you had to combine like the, the key things, what would they be? So um, I'm going to talk about my programs guide a little bit to, to make the analogy for this, because Liz P Carlson, who I wrote the CFS programs guide with, we have a guide of over 22 programs that are out there, we, wow. we had to figure out how to categorize them. And we figured out that there's four kinds of programs out there, like online recovery programs. There's lifestyle programs. So ones where that help you with your everyday lifestyle. So sleep, pacing, nutrition, um, boundary setting, these kinds of things that'll help you in your day-to-day -day life. So that was definitely an aspect for me, learning how to handle all of those things. There's so many tiny factors in there, sleep routine to eating well, all of those things in lifestyle. The second area of programs, which again, I needed was the brain retraining slash mindset. Some people don't need a full brain retraining program to get there, but I think mindset is a really huge part of recovery 
And for me, it's just crazy when I think about how different um, I used to think about things <laughs> than I do now, like how much I used to dwell and how much um, I was just a much more negative person overall, I would say, and a much more fearful person. Um, and brain retraining is really helpful for changing the way you think about things and using different neural pathways. Um, the third area is somatics or somatic body work. So a lot of us who get these illnesses tend to be very disconnected with our bodies. Like we're very much in our heads and we lose that connection with our bodies. And I don't even think I was that disconnected. I was from the start doing body scanning. I've always been pretty into Buddhism, but doing things like polyvagal exercises routinely for six, 12 months have really, really helped. Like that's one area. Have you explored polyvagal work at all? Yeah, I have. So in Primal Trust, uh, Dr. Cat talks a lot about that stuff and I was doing some of it. And then like a lot of things, I've let some of it go. Um, mm -hmm. Well, all of it. So, well, yeah. but you are because you, aren't you doing that um, cold water dipping? I saw from your story. That's oh, probably yeah. okay. So yeah, I mean, I'm doing stuff like that. I mean, to be honest, I'm kind of just like like I'm doing uh, like sauna and cold water exposure, mm. but also uh, like I I do this kind of breath work. Um, mm. Like this is like a really intense journey that you go on, and and I do that like once or twice a week. Sometimes, uh, mostly with with a one on one practitioner, and that's really helping me retrain, like repattern uh, my nervous system, like completely. Yeah, your like, vagus nerve. Yeah, so yeah. so that's so I I think I am, but I'm just not doing maybe out of a book or anything. No, I think you are. You just don't realize you are totally. Yeah. Like a big thing for me is like humming. Like I know it sounds silly, but I didn't notice anything for months, but then after six months or so, when I didn't do my humming in the morning, I realized like I didn't feel as good and it really was doing something. I also started like a lymphatic drainage um, technique, which I just learned on YouTube. I know that you can go to a professional, but it really felt good. Like it feels like it's getting the juices flowing in your body in the morning. So these are all somatic exercises to get you more in tune with your body. Some people do grounding work. Mm. Um, and then the fourth area, which I also needed, was self-discovery work. And that includes trauma work. Um, people need different levels of trauma work. We can talk about what that includes. But even from understanding your personality type and, and why you tend to be an achiever or a perfectionist, which many of us are, um, understanding why we do the things we do. Also our nervous systems, they were programmed very young, like in young adolescent lessons, a lot of scientists have talked about uh, the effects of our young childhood on our nervous system throughout our life. So for me, it's been very helpful to do trauma work and, and look at my young childhood. And when I'm saying trauma, just, so everyone knows like there's small T trauma and big T trauma. So small T trauma is, can literally be as simple as people not acknowledging or being attuned to your sensitivities in your childhood. Like it can be so simple. It doesn't necessarily mean you had some traumatic event. Um, and it's often like a lot of little things over time one thing I always wonder about as being one of my issues, I was born with one side of my neck shorter than the other. And as a baby, they did like a lot of physio on my neck. And my mom would talk about how I'd cry and cry as a baby. And you could just imagine this little baby's nervous system as like their necks being pulled around. I've also had whiplash twice. <laughs> and then again, another car accident. So my poor neck has been through so much. And my entire master's thesis, my neck was also in so much pain. So it's really interesting when you think you start to look back on your childhood um, and how these factors might be a part of it. And then if you get into like inner child work and like comforting that inner child, or if you're into the work of Gabor Mate, who talks about how emotions can be stored in the body mm -hmm. and then how somatic processing can release that. 
anyway, I think I'm just blabbing now, but there's a lot of work I've done, I would say. And yeah. I think that's why I have the confidence at this point that I'm not going to uh, relapse because I've done so much work. Mm. Yeah, I guess uh, to anyone listening, uh, so I think some people, some people take on a lot of um, like some people might listen to that and think, oh, wow, there's loads of different ways I can recover. And then other people probably what I would have been like, it's a bit like, oh, wow, that's so overwhelming. And mm. perfectionist comes through because you're like, I have to do all of that in order to recover. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I think what I've realized is that I I've seen some areas, maybe I need a little bit of work, but it's the other areas that I need loads more, more work. Did you find it was like one, like more of, it was it across all of them that you, you felt like it made a difference or was it more in one or two areas? Um, I mean, I think again, I totally agree with you. That can sound overwhelming, but if you look at it as just like four areas, and have a curious mindset about them not a mindset of like I have to do this I have to do this but just look at them as like could this be something that's helpful in my journey and stop taking the like timeline part of it because healing is a lifelong journey right like we we can be physically healed of our um fatigue but I'm still looking at doing different ways to improve my my mental health, my physical health, understand myself better. So would I say that one more than any? It's hard to say, you know, like they've all like cumulatively been helpful. And I think like programs like Dr. Katz touches on all those areas that I spoke about mm -hmm. um, and CFS school is one that goes into more of the trauma area and the brain retraining and the somatics not as much the lifestyle but those four areas are ones I would recommend people like think about at least mm -hmm. but you also have to be ready for them that's another weird thing about recovery is you really can't force the timing of it Earlier in my recovery, a friend said to me, like, um, I think this is a trauma illness. She's a, she's a counselor. So <laughs> that, that, of course, she's like, this is a trauma illness. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm fine. Like, my childhood was fine. So I really wasn't ready to go there. Um, whereas now looking back at it, I can totally see how that's a huge piece of my healing. So it's really interesting. We can't really force it if we're not ready to go there too. So I agree. People often when they're looking for a program, they want something that includes everything because they just want to get there as fast as possible. But sometimes it's best to just concentrate on one area for a while. And that might be all you need. Mm. If it's not, you can try another area. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, def definitely. Um, and I think... I see quite a lot of people getting quite angry. At, like I've had a few, I've had pretty much most of the, like the main, like I've had um, Dr. Gupta, uh, Annie Hopper, I recently had Phil Parker on and then, you know, Dr. Cat, stuff like that. And and I think people get like very triggered about these things. Are they, there's a lot of like, Oh, it's a scam or, you know, and I think people need to realize that, it's going to work for some people. It's just not going to work for other people, but that doesn't mean just because it didn't work for you. That means that there's another program that's better suited for you. And that, or as, as you just said, the, the timing's not right for you at that time. I, I did, I tried do, the, like, the Gupta program and I was not ready to even come close to doing that. Um, mm -hmm. But that's not to say it doesn't work. I know it works. I Like I, you can see there's examples of it. Um, so yeah, what what would you say to someone now who's listening to this, who's thinking, oh, I, no, I, I, I'm, I'm so overwhelmed. I can't think about which one to choose. Um, yeah. What, what, what would you say to them? Well, so <laughs> plug my own business, but what I'm doing right now is helping people navigate the best route for them. And you definitely don't have to work with me. You can figure this stuff out on your own probably, but there's a lot of factors I've come up with to, to look at um, within your story to figure out what the right program is for you. Uh, you first might want to buy our programs guide. It's pretty cheap. It's only $19, which gives you all the program choices. I think one of the problems is people are all, only know about a few programs. Mm -hmm. So they only are choosing between a few of the options. 
But some of the big factors out there, I find a big difference between people who are perfectionists and people who are just achievers. Because I'm not a perfectionist, but I'm an achiever. Mm. Whereas people who are, who are perfectionists, for example, often have trouble with programs like the lightning process or DNRS because they feel like they have to be catching every single time that they have a negative thought or they have to do it for an hour a day or else they're doing it wrong. Like they get a little bit too caught up on the details. Whereas for me, I was pretty quickly easily to be like, oh, I'm just going to do this 20 minutes a day. I'm going to do it sitting down, even though they say standing, you know, I, I modified it pretty quickly. So for me, that structure of do it every day for six months was really good for me. Whereas some people, they have a little bit of a, and my podcast partner, Stu, has this, this like um, reaction in them when people tell them what to do of like a little kid being like, no, don't tell me what to do. You know, <laughs> are you like that? Um, you, you, yeah. So describing me those to people, those people do better with programs that are much less structured usually yeah. Um, that don't tell them they have to do this every day this much. Um, they often do better with programs. Well, and then there's the visualization aspect. I know you've talked about that as well. Some people are better at visualizing than others. There's certain programs that you don't even have to go there. Like, I think you probably stressed yourself out with the visualizing part, right? Yeah, uh, I, I think for a long time, maybe I made myself worse by like thinking that being able to visualize was the only way to recover. Uh, like right. I can't like, convince myself that that was what it was. And I, cause I couldn't do that. I, you know, I wouldn't be able to improve, which is, yeah. So I didn't even know there were courses that didn't involve that at all. Yeah. Yeah. When, for example, the reorigin program is pretty new, but it's um, a brain retraining course. Um, the guy, Ben Aaron's teamed up with a neuroscientist and a psychologist to create the program. So it's really science-based and yeah, he gives you a lot of alternatives to visualizing. Um, I think you'd like that one. He's a, he was a pro surfer before he got sick. Okay. Um, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of programs out there. So I think it's about figuring out what really fits for you and also looking at your factors of what got you sick, which sometimes we don't even realize till later. Like mm -hmm. I said, like, if you think it's possible that your childhood is a factor that you haven't completely processed, then maybe looking at trauma work. But if your nervous system is like so sensitive right now, it, you might not be ready for it yet. You know, mm -hmm. like that's something I do warn people to like be gentle. You just have to be so gentle with yourself mm -hmm. and it's a learning process. So when I work with clients, it's like a bit of me making suggestions and talking about different programs, but in the end, it's their choice. I think it has to be your choice. And there's often a gut feeling too of like, oh, I really connect with this program creator. And I often encourage people to go that way if they feel that connection. Because if you have that strong connection with them, you're more likely to follow through with the activities. Mm -hmm. Where if you're like, mm, I'm not sure, I don't really relate to them or the people in it. Yeah, it can be harder to actually make yourself do it. <laughs> yeah. um, some people also need more of the community factor. Some programs have more of a community than others, whereas some people don't need that or want that. Mm -hmm. Some people like a lot of scientific background, like ANS Rewire has a lot of science in it, um, whereas some people, that's a turnoff for them. So mm -hmm. people are so individual that it's really hard for me to say. But in our programs guide, we give some prompts at the end to help people get thinking about what might be right for them. Mm -hmm. um, we also have some FAQs about brain retraining so people can like really think about what this means and go yeah. in with the right attitude. And we also, the categories we have in the guide are things like what to keep in mind if you take this program and what it doesn't include and what sets it apart from other programs. And we have a little section of who it's for, who it's not for. And these are all based on interviews with people who've done these programs before, as well as the program creators. And some of the programs gave me access to the programs themselves. So I've gone through quite a bit of them, a few of them myself. So 
Awesome. Yeah. awesome. No, I think that could be, you know, as you said, um, I'm, always, I'm always really careful, like, with uh, I never ever want people to think because I've also had a lot of comments. People saying I get people on the show to like promote their promote their thing, and that's never ever what we're doing. Um, mm-hmm. But I think what you're doing is really interesting, and I do think sometimes people just need a little bit of structure. I could have done, I'm, you know, I might buy it as well just to see what it's what it's like. But I also think there's also some people who don't definitely don't need it uh, and could do it themselves. So I don't want people to think that, you know, we're, we're ramming some, any of this down their, down their throat at all. But like, I, I think what you're doing is really interesting and, and actually quite unique. And I don't think there's anything out there like it. So that's, that's really good. My final question for you, just going back into your story really is just, um well a couple of questions firstly like how do you think your life is like different now compared to how it could have been had you you know your 20s continued on in your 30s like without any of the the health issues is is are there like other ways in which you can say now that you're really grateful for things that have happened and the way it's panned out could you give us some detail on that yeah I definitely would say I'm a totally different person (laughs) than I would have been without being sick and I am very grateful for it it's really hard to tell someone in the thick of it I talk about that with some of the people I've interviewed for post-viral podcast there's no way to tell someone in the thick of it like you'll be grateful for this after and maybe they won't but um, in my case, I really, I, I mean, I, I've benefited in so many ways. I used to be very, I had a lot of imposter syndrome. My whole master's, I was like telling myself, I'm dumb, I'm dumb, I'm dumb. Because I was like, it's better to just accept it, accept that I'm dumb. <laughs> Things like that, that I was just so harsh on myself. One of the ahas in my recovery was realizing that I'm just as valuable a human being, whether I'm bed bound or I'm out volunteering and doing all these things, my internal value actually stays the same. Um, I think a lot of us as achievers think we're not valuable unless we're doing or helping. Um, That was a huge change in my life. Um, Yeah. And with post-viral podcast, now I'm interviewing experts in a variety of areas, Just, just also to say I'm not all about programs are the only solution. Um, yeah. I'm talking to experts in all kinds of areas. And I mean, the other day I got to interview Sharon Salzberg, who's like so huge in the Buddhist community. She's like best friends with the Dalai Lama. What a yeah. dream come true. Like I never would have been yeah. actualizing things that I'm able to do now. I would have probably kept doing a job that it wasn't terrible. <laughs> But it wasn't what I love to do. I've been kind of forced into doing what I love, I feel like. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's so many elements to it that I feel like my life has benefited um, I in like, the long run. I was lucky when that's a long answer. Because um, <laughs> it means that, you know, there's a lot there to be to be grateful for, for sure. What would be, you know, you mentioned you you hitting rock bottom. There'll be people listening to that this right now who are there or thereabouts. Like, what would be your advice to them to for them to keep going and and keep pushing forward and not really give up? Yeah, so that's a good question. And there's kind of the acute answer of what in the moment versus the long run answer, um, which are kind of different. Because if you're at, at that rock bottom and you're questioning whether it's worth living, there's some like in the moment things that I would recommend the first thing being talk to someone. Anytime you get in that headspace, talk to someone. I know you might be so sensitive to light and noise and sound, but it's so important not to keep all those feelings bottled up and to let someone know that you're feeling like that. It often releases a lot of the pressure that we build up inside ourselves. I remember when I had a friend come visit me on the island and I was like, I've been thinking these thoughts, you know, like jumping off those cliffs and and just letting all that out to her was really, really helpful for me. Um, definitely, it's hard to talk about gratitude because you're like, be grateful when you're in the worst situation possible. Yeah. But there are always things we can look at 
And I remember in those days, I was like crying and so upset, but I was like listing things I'm grateful for to keep myself from going so negative. So that's another thing that I would recommend. Yeah, there's a lot of little acute things. I think um, mental health uh, is such a huge interplay with this illness. So take care of yourself. In the long run, I think it's just continued on that curiosity path around people who have gotten better and who have been at rock bottom. But keep in mind, there's people like me out there who no matter how bad it is, they've gotten out of that. And recovery does look different for everybody, but things can improve. Nothing stays the same. So I think that mindset is just really important to keep fostering. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your story. And yeah, it sounds like there's many, there's many different places that people can check you out. But uh, the best place for someone to reach out to you, how would they best do that? Well, on Instagram, I'm CFS programs underscore navigator or at post viral podcast. Those are both my my places you can reach me for sure. Awesome. Or sorry, or lindsayvine.com. It's all at <laughs> lindsayvine.com okay. also. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and, and what you're doing now. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to get this out there to, to everyone. I'm sure I know it'll make a huge difference to them. I hope so. <laughs> really nice meeting you, Phil.